There's always that one game in your friend group. That one obscure bad game that either you or one of your friends played and told you about that just becomes a big meme amongst your group. I bet you're thinking of that game now and how funny it is. Well, there are a few games like that for me. One of my friends has a bit of an affinity for bad games. The dude got all the achievements in Ride to Hell Retribution, including the one for beating the game on the hardest difficulty, which he had to do basically twice because of a game-breaking glitch that forced him to start over again. So naturally, we get some funny stories out of him. But there was one game in particular that he enlightened us on that became infamous in our group. Escape from Bug Island. Look at this box art. Take it all in. This is an early Wii survival horror game made by some unknown third party. What could possibly go wrong? You know, I was quite content never playing this game, but my friend was quite insistent that I review it, to the point he let me borrow it. Welp, here's the review. Are you happy now, Ben? I was gonna wait much longer to look at this game, but figured it would make a good Halloween video. So might as well get this over with. Let's just get right into it. In the red corner! So the game starts with our three main characters, Michelle, Mike, and Ray, arriving on this island. Ray and Mike are supposedly best friends, and Ray is into Michelle, but hasn't confessed yet. Michelle is the one who really wanted to go to this island because she's obsessed with bugs and wants to study them. This island is apparently a paradise for insects as described in the Necro Notes, which Michelle for some reason has. She apparently picked up the book before the trip, and it's an ancient text about the insects on this island. I should mention, it doesn't get revealed until like halfway through the game, but the island is the Island of Beazelbub. What could go wrong? Guys! Over here! Look! This species only exists on this island! Yeah, assuming you were able to even convince me to step foot on this island, this is when I'd leave. The group sets up camp and they waste no time making Mike an absolutely hateable asshole. In the first scene, he and Ray are talking about Michelle and how Ray is into her and is going to confess to her tonight. And Mike says, Hey, we're best friends. I would never go after your girl. But then, only a few minutes later, when Ray is asking Mike to leave them alone for a minute, presumably to finally confess, Mike, just out of nowhere, asks Michelle to be his girlfriend in front of Ray. He doesn't just say that. He goes on about loving her and how he put a lot of thought into it, even stealing a line from Ray. After Michelle leaves to think about what just happened, Mike then makes fun of Ray and goes on about how he wasn't interested in her until Ray started talking about how great she was and literally says it's his fault he now loves Michelle. Then he goes off to find her even though she said she wanted to be alone and Mike had just told Ray to let her go. And when Ray points that out, he's like, Chicks dig that kind of stuff. Mike is a douchebag, and I hate it. He also is always holding that shotgun, and will just randomly point it. There's even a scene where he accidentally shoots it, but no one reacts to it. Ray falls asleep, but when he wakes up, the others haven't gotten back, so he wanders off into the woods to find them. It doesn't take long before Ray discovers that this island is covered in giant mutated bugs that try to kill him. Now contrary to the name of the game, bugs aren't the only threat here, as there are various other mutants. There's killer fish, carnivorous plants, giant frogs, canine men, Amazonian lizard women. Yes, they are actually described as Amazonian lizard women in one of the notes. And the best of all, a giant purple gorilla with an exposed brain. 
Not a lot of story happens for a while. There are various notes you can find from someone who was here before to, I suppose, add some world building, but the writing is so bad it's hard to take seriously. Ray eventually runs into these two, Harry and Lynn, who constantly argue and are just annoying and don't add much of anything. Plus, Harry dies almost immediately and Lynn runs away. Eventually, you find Mike and Michelle being attacked by a giant spider. Michelle faints while Mike nearly falls off the bridge and is hanging on. Someone you haven't met also takes Michelle away. But by the time you get there and defeat the spider, Mike falls to his death. Oh no! Anyway! At one point, you get a random scene of Lynn being attacked by lizard women, only to be saved by her boyfriend Robert, who was the one that moved Michelle earlier, even though you aren't even there to see this. But shortly after, you're being chased by a giant worm and run into them, and they both immediately get eaten by the thing. After that, we get a scene of Michelle waking up in a temple, only to see the gorilla staring at her through the window. You okay, lady? Then I suppose she thinks she didn't get a good enough look at it because she immediately runs out to where it is. Dumbass. She somehow survives and hides in a cave where Ray catches up with her later. Here she gives some information in the Necronotes. Apparently this cave is called the Cave of Time. People used to say this cave could send you back and forth through time. Ray is understandably skeptical of this, but Michelle tells him to be a little more open-minded. Open-minded? Look, I know we've been dealing with giant bugs, gorillas, and lizard women, but time travel is a bit more of a leap here. Not too long after, they run into Beazelbub himself, who kills Michelle and knocks Ray around until he falls down this hole. Ray then wakes up back at camp before Michelle and Mike run off. Ray was sent back in time, and he retains full memory of what happened, but he thinks it was a nightmare. I can understand thinking it was a dream at first, but it takes him quite a long time for him to realize it wasn't, even though events play out pretty similarly to before, and he even still has all the stuff he got in the dream. You didn't bring that halberd to this island, Ray. Where do you think it came from? The moment he saw another giant mantis is when he should have known it wasn't just a dream. But anyways, Michelle and Mike go off again, and Ray does nothing to stop them. He even falls asleep like last time. Ray is kind of an idiot. So now Ray retraces his steps, but things play a little differently. He manages to save Harry, Lynn, Robert, and yes, even Mike. We couldn't just have let him stay dead. Well, after saving him, now he wants to make finding Michelle a contest. Whoever finds her first gets her, I guess. Mike is still a douchebag. Though he does give you his shotgun, so I guess that's character development? When you save Robert, we get some exposition. He's the one who translated the Necronotes, though Ray keeps saying he wrote them even though he just translated it. Anyways, this is when Ray finally figures out it wasn't a dream, and apparently going through the time portal destabilized the island's magnetic field, which is causing seismic activity. Um, okay then. He tells Ray where Michelle is, and he goes to find her. After that, he runs into Robert again, and we learn that there is a gas in the island that is cause for all the mutants, and it apparently also affects humans. You know, after hearing that, knowing that this guy has been studying the island for three years, has medicine that can temporarily delay mutation that he has grown an immunity for, then coughs up blood before dropping dead, no one connects the dots that maybe he might mutate. So they leave Robert's corpse there, and Lynn calls up a helicopter to save them. Because she could have just done that at any time and just didn't for whatever reason. Even Ray calls her out on this. Ray catches up with Michelle again in the Cave of Time, where they are attacked by Beazelbub again. But this time, he doesn't just immediately kill Michelle. Ray somehow manages to kill Beazelbub and takes Michelle out of there, where they meet up with all the other survivors and the helicopter. The helicopter can't lift everyone at once, and the volcano is going to erupt or something. So one person has to stay behind and escape another way. There is so much filler dialogue here about arguing whether Ray or Mike should stay behind, and it's tedious. But eventually, Ray is the one who stays behind. He walks all the way back to the beginning, where a different boat than the one he came to the island with is waiting for him. But before he can leave, Robert mutates into this fly monster and attacks. 
Ray kills him and escapes. Apparently there's an alternate ending where Robert's still alive and attacks Ray on the boat, presumably killing him, but either way, it's not a very satisfying ending. Well, that story was certainly something. Not good, though. It's a very simple story that didn't have much thought put into it. There's not much substance to it at all, and thus, not a whole lot to analyze. But I'll try. Let's start with the characters. The characters are all planks of wood. They're all one note and devoid of any interesting personality. Even while playing the game, I couldn't really describe most of the characters. They're so boring. Well, besides Mike, whose entire personality is that of sandpaper. He's an asshole and nothing else, but I've already said all that can be said about Mike. There's no development for the guy. He has nothing else going for him other than being an asshole. At the very least, he's such a cartoonish asshole that he ends up being funny, which is more than I can say for the rest of the cast. Okay, but what about Michelle? She likes bugs, and that's really it. There isn't much to her besides liking bugs. She only exists for Ray and Mike to fight over and for Ray to have a reason to even be here. She's just an object, a MacGuffin. She's not a character. There is so little substance to anything in this game that what can I even analyze? What do you want me to say about her? What is there to say about her? Ray is the most fleshed out character only because you play as him. He's still a cardboard box. And because we see more of this guy, we can see contradictions in his character. He supposedly is scared of bugs, but shows no hesitation to run right into a bug-infested island with a stick and a pile of rocks. While not as bad as Mike, Ray is also an asshole. He's even an ass to Michelle, telling her to shut up at one point when she's about to talk about how she feels about the situation with Mike. The only other thing I can even say about Ray's character is he's an idiot. But I think that was already adequately demonstrated with the summary, and how he just fell asleep and let Mike and Michelle go off into the giant bug-infested forest. Ray sucks. He's just a boring and shallow character. And the three extra characters are even more shallow. Harry only exists for the other characters to hate him, and I guess he's kind of a dick who thinks he's really important. But you really can't expect me to hate anyone else when Mike is hogging up all my disdain. Harry's only purpose is for you to get the bug spray. He does nothing else. Even when he lives, he contributes nothing. Lynn's only purpose is to call the helicopter at the end. That's it. I guess she's also there to have a connection to Robert, but it's shallow. I mean, she's supposed to be his fiance, but she hardly reacts to his death. Even starts hitting on Ray near the end. Like, seriously? We're doing this kind of thing? And it served no purpose at all. After she calls him cute, it's just never brought up again. And then there's Robert, who literally only exists for exposition. That's it. He's a walking sign with the script on it. He tells you about the time portal, Beelzebub, and the gas infecting everything. Then he dies. Oh, and I guess he's the final boss, but it really doesn't add much of anything. None of these characters are interesting, likable, or memorable. Moving on to the writing. Shocker, but it isn't good. There wasn't much thought gone into the writing. The world building is basically non-existent. I mentioned before these notes you can find of other people who are on the island, but they don't add a whole lot. They don't really explain anything about the world. It's mostly one guy who came here with his girlfriend and I think some other friends without a reason given, and they are in danger while the girlfriend is missing. The only real purpose of the notes is for either tutorialization or to tell you where to go. They offer nothing for world building, and the way they are written comes off so awkward. Like this one where the guy is like, giant bugs just ate one of my friends. Actually, from the sound of it, they are still eating him. Before talking about their nest and how he's thinking about throwing stuff at it to knock it down, and then about his girlfriend and a lighter she dropped. It's just written so matter-of-factly. There's no emotion to it. His friend got eaten and he's absurdly casual about it. It comes off very nonchalantly. It doesn't sound like he really cares. He's not angry. He's not scared. He's not disgusted. He's not distressed. He's explaining what's happening. And then he immediately starts talking about his girlfriend, also in a nonchalant way. You know what? Let me write a better note here. What if he said something like this? My... my friend. He's been eaten by those things. Oh god, I can still hear them devouring what's left of them. <laughs> I just left him. I know I had to help the others hide, but, but I just left him. I swear, 
I'll avenge him. I saw a nest or something in a tree nearby. Bet I can knock that down if I throw something big enough at it. But before that, I need to find my girlfriend. We got separated, and I don't know how I could live with myself if anything happened to her. I found her lighter. She must have dropped it. Which means she could be close. I have to find her. Someone probably could write something better than what I did. But it already has way more emotion while conveying the same information. The nest, a hint on how to destroy it, and highlighting the lighter as an important item. And all the notes are written like this, very casual and with no emotion. In another note he says, I think all my friends are dead. I feel bad, but then none of us were that close. Like who talks about this about their dead friends? Even if you aren't close or whatever. Oh, and then he finally finds his girlfriend, but she runs off and he's like, I'm glad she's alive, but then that means that she still probably won't let me use her phone. Oh well. Like, bro, really? And then he finds out his girlfriend is taken up with a colony of Amazonian lizard women, and his reaction is to break up with her. Not try to get her to come back or anything, but break up with her. And also hit her in the face with a sandbag. He's just like, call me callous, but I just can't envision spending the rest of my life with a woman who eats bugs for lunch. Like, dude, do you care this little? The writing is so awkward. It feels like the kind of stuff people would say to each other jokingly, not something they'd say if they were actually in this situation. And that really hurts the tone. It's impossible to take this seriously. And the character writing isn't much better. In fact, it's probably worse. The characters speak just as unnaturally, and Ray especially can come off as childish at points. I can't help but internally hear this dialogue in the most childish voice possible. The dialogue drags on so much. Most cutscenes are way longer than necessary because they just won't shut up. It's so tedious reading through all this damn text. It really doesn't help that there's very minimal amounts of voice acting. Some parts of some scenes have voice acting. <sighs> this feels wonderful! Well, it's not exactly my idea, Paradise. What do you think, Ray? Huh? Did you say something about Michelle? You might get a few words or maybe a sentence of voice acting before it just goes to full text. <laughs> Are you okay? Yes. Why even bother having any voice acting if this is all you'll do? There's one voiced scene where they don't even say a word. They just make grunting noises. <laughs> yeah, that was worth it. But aside from dialogue, the game was so sloppily written. The actual story just isn't good, and they don't properly explain things. You're just told things exist and are expected to just accept it. Just accept that there is this gas that is mutating everything. Just accept that there's a time portal in this normal looking cave. What does the Cave of Time even have to do with anything else that was going on here? What does it have to do with the giant bugs and the other mutants or the gas that caused them? This island seems to have two different anomalies that have nothing to do with each other. The gas that mutates anything that inhales enough of it, and the time portal. There's no link to these two things, and there's no cause for either. Where did the gas and time portal come from? We're not given any explanation, or even have speculation of what might have caused them. Did Beazelbub have anything to do with it? Robert makes a big deal about Beazelbub without even giving a hint as to what it is, just saying that people thought he was crazy. Is this thing a god, or the devil, or just a big mutant? The game doesn't give any hint as to what it is, so as far as I can tell, it is just a mutant, so not the cause of the gas or time portal. But speaking of the time portal, the time travel stuff was very poorly thought out. Ray is sent back in time with full knowledge of what happened, but falls asleep anyways. He does change events by saving the people who died, but not because he knew what would happen and acted to prevent it. It just plays out differently for no reason. 
The first time you run into Harry and Lynn, Harry wants you to get his bag that he dropped while running from a mantis. You get it from their nest, and when you get back, they're being chased by a mantis, and then the gorilla attacks, killing Harry. The second time you run into them, Harry doesn't tell you to get his bag, but instead wants you to destroy a mantis nest. So you go and do that. This time, when you get back, they aren't being chased, but the gorilla still attacks. Though you are able to save Harry this time. What causes these changes to happen? Ray doesn't really do anything different enough to make a change here. Random things will be different. You'll have access to areas you didn't the first time, for some reason, even though you did nothing to make that change. The only reason you save Robert and Lynn from the worm is because now you have the ability to kill it. Not because of any knowledge from having experienced this before, or acquiring a weapon that could kill it, but because now these exploding anthills are here, where they previously weren't. What caused them to be here? What was the point of the time travel? They don't do anything with it narratively other than, I guess, to have an excuse to kill all these characters while also saving them in the end. But it falls flat, because they just don't use it for anything interesting. It's just a repeat of the first time, but slightly different, which isn't very good writing. The narrative of this game is very sloppy, and just bad. There's not much else to say. I probably stretched it out longer than it needed to. Some may say this is going for a campy B-movie style, so it's intentionally bad, but I really don't think this was intentional. The vibe this game is giving me is it was trying to be serious, but just failed at every corner. But onto the presentation, and this won't take too long. It's an early third-party Wii game, and it looks exactly like it. It's a very dull looking game, and I get it's supposed to be a horror game so it shouldn't be bright and colorful, but the atmosphere is very generic and boring. All you really get is a dull looking forest at night with fog. Nothing about it is visually interesting or unsettling. The lighting is very basic and boring, and little to no environmental storytelling. Very few things could be described as environmental storytelling, and they hardly do much of anything. The beginning has a mostly destroyed cabin, but that's about it. There are various shacks and small cabins around, but they are pretty intact and mostly empty. Plus, there's no hint towards their purpose or who would have built them. Why are these here? Was this a campsite? Why didn't the bugs destroy these? Aside from the random cabins, shacks, this bridge, and the temple, there's not much sign of other people being here or what happened to them. The temple would seem to be important, but there really isn't much to it. It's just a generic temple ruins with no explanation for why they are here or who built them, and for what purpose. And these are the only ruins, by the way. Perhaps if there were more ruins spread across the island, one could infer that an ancient civilization once inhabited this island before whatever caused the gas appeared and turned everyone into mutants, which led to the collapse of said civilization. Maybe even imply that the lizard women and canine men were people from the civilization? But there is no connection to those enemy types in these ruins. They don't appear here. The lizard women in particular really bother me because they seem like they could be more intelligent and thus possibly get some environmental details possibly showing their culture or whatever. I mean, that guy who left the notes around had a girlfriend who joined them. So do they have, like, villages? No, they are just an enemy type plopped into this game. Imagine if in their territory, I don't know, you saw very primitive structures like huts or torches. Maybe even posts covered in bones to act like a warning. Maybe have some kind of insignia that you would see in various places. Maybe if the lizard women themselves wore clothes or even used bones as armor. You know, this is very generic and stereotypical stuff for primitive savage tribes, but it's still more effort than the literal zero that was put into this game. The only kind of slightly interesting bit of environmental storytelling is in one part of the temple, there are some statues of bugs in this one part of the level. Which implies whatever the civilization was, assuming it was big enough to be a civilization, worshipped these bugs or maybe even Beelzebub himself. But that's it. It's so shallow. Beelzebub himself also just comes out of nowhere. And they could have built up to him more with some environmental storytelling. Again, going with the idea of having ruins all across the island. Perhaps have depictions of Beelzebub spread around. Maybe even have the characters comment on it. But no, you get nothing. I think I made my point. The atmosphere is dull and there's practically no environmental storytelling, which makes the whole island very bland and forgettable. But for other visual aspects, the character models are very basic, nothing much to say there. 
Though I suppose the bug models look fine enough. I could see someone with extreme entomophobia or arachnophobia actually being scared of these things. But as someone with mild entomophobia, this game does not scare me in the slightest. I guess to give some credit, the centipedes do kind of creep me out, and I really don't like when they start crawling on you. Ugh. But not to the point I can't look at them. The roaches also kind of creep me out as well, but not as much. Everything else does nothing. If I saw a spider in my room, I'd be pretty freaked out. But looking at these doesn't affect me much at all. So I doubt anyone who doesn't have an extreme phobia of bugs will be very scared of anything in this game. Uh, unless they have a phobia of gorillas. But now I want to talk about the animations, or lack of animations. Oh, there are cutscenes with animations in them, but they are so stiff and awkward looking. She fell through the floor. They couldn't have even animated her landing. There's this pre-rendered intro, but none of the cutscenes look like it. It doesn't even look that good anyways. I mean, look at the gorilla here. Jeez. But most of the cutscenes are just looking at characters in their idle animations. Maybe with a couple small animations here or there, like Mike pointing his gun at nothing. But this is what you're looking at in most of the cutscenes, and it's so boring. The only kind of interesting thing visually about these is the filter over it, but you're gonna have to do a lot more than that. This feels extremely low budget, and to be fair, it probably is very low budget. But that's not an excuse for just how bad this game looks. And that's all there really is to say about the visuals. Now, for the music, and this really isn't gonna last long, because this game barely has a soundtrack. Most of the time, you won't even have music, and I get it. It's a horror game, and they're trying to build an atmosphere. But the visuals don't do much for the atmosphere, so having music could have helped. Music is a big part of atmosphere, and a lot of times something that is very atmospheric just becomes dull without the music. Now, of course, there are times when being silent is how to build a good atmosphere, but this game doesn't do it well. There are very few tracks in the game, like only eight or something. Not enough to use for all this video, so no, most of the music I'm playing is not from this game, and all the music is rather generic and boring anyways. It's not that bad, I suppose, but it's very unmemorable. Like, the second I stop listening to any of these tracks, I forget them. Well, except for a couple. One is the big enemy music because of how frequently it plays. More importantly, it plays any time a big enemy sees you, which you can increase how far they can see you with the flashlight, so you can do this. Not to mention that loud note at the start plays for every enemy that sees you, even if music is already playing. Another track is this music. because it plays in a bunch of scenes, especially at the beginning, when saving and when reading notes. So you hear it all the time. There really isn't anything to say, and all this comes down to a very underwhelming presentation. Presentation is very important to horror. It might even be the most important element, and the presentation is so dull that it fails to create an appropriate atmosphere to suit it. 
The game is not scary, largely in part to the lackluster visuals, music, and sound design. Well, I think it's time to start talking about the actual game now. This is a survival horror game, or at least it tries to be. Right away you have a tutorial, and it's a long and tedious one. It's one of those that bombards you with text telling you about each action, and what each bit of the HUD is, and how it works, and makes you perform every single action. It's tutorials like these that make me really appreciate how games like Mario 64 handle tutorialization. You get this wide open space outside the castle to just mess around and learn how to play. For some extra help, you can read these signs, but you can just skip them if you already know how to play. And of all games where it would be appropriate, it would be Mario 64, considering this would have been quite a few people's first time experiencing a 3D game. Tutorials are sometimes necessary. Some games are too complex to just have you figure it out on your own. But you have to do it naturally. Just listing out all your moves is overwhelming. It's hard to really remember them all this way. After I completed the tutorial, I forgot most of my moveset, only really learned it again after experimenting myself. It's better for you to naturally get to know what you can do one at a time, rather than all at once like this. And having it all at once just makes it really tedious. But to this game's credit, you can skip the tutorial, so there's that at least. Although, you'll want to do this tutorial because, oh god, the controls. Remember, this is an early third-party Wii game. Get ready for overly complicated and cumbersome motion controls. But before that, you have tank controls. It's not the worst feeling tank controls, but still annoying. You move backwards so slowly though, like seriously? Moving, turning on and off your flashlight, and interacting with stuff like items or save points are like the only things you can do that don't involve motion controls. By shaking the Wiimote, you will do a dodge roll, but only to the right. To roll left, you need to shake the nunchuck. That is just annoying. Why have two different inputs for the same thing, just in a different direction? That just overcomplicates an already overcomplicated moveset. You can also do a back step, which is the only way you'll be going backwards with any amount of speed. To do it, you hold the control stick down while shaking the nunchuck up. So we have three different inputs for dodging, when it would have been better if there was one dodge input and the direction you dodged was dependent on where the analog stick is pointed. That would have been much simpler, easier to remember, and not cumbersome to perform in the middle of action. So to attack, you need a melee weapon selected, then hold B and shake the Wiimote. There are three different directions you can swing, right in front of you, up, or down. To swing up, you need to do the same, but hold up on the analog stick, and hold down to swing down. At least for these inputs, it's one attack input combined with a direction. You can perform a three hit combo if you keep shaking, but you can't cancel out of it. So a lot of the time you take damage because the game registered more swings even when you didn't mean to, and you get stuck in the animation. Also for the mid attack, the last hit changes depending on how hard you shake the Wiimote. The harder you swing, the more you're left open. It probably does more damage, but that's not gonna matter much. In the middle of action, it's difficult to do specifically a light or heavy attack. This is unnecessary, it overcomplicates the controls, it just puts you at a disadvantage with longer cooldowns for you to just get hit more. By holding A, you go into first person and have pointer controls for aiming. If you have a throwable weapon, shaking the Wiimote will throw it, but how hard you shake determines how far it goes which is annoying as mostly when that matters is not in the middle of combat, but when trying to get fruit out of a tree. If you have a gun, pushing B while aiming will shoot, but otherwise holding B will lock your reticle in place, which can be convenient. If you have a melee weapon selected, you'll need to lock it and then shake the Wiimote to stab. This move is really useless, and I think you can only do one stab at a time without letting go of B, which is really annoying and makes it even more useless than before. You're gonna be doing a lot of waggling in this game, and it doesn't take long for it to get tiring. This moveset is overly cumbersome and awkward to use. Nintendo knew the limits of the Wiimote and designed their games to use them in simple and intelligent ways. Mario Galaxy basically had two inputs for motion controls, shaking the Wiimote to do a spin move, and to use the pointer to pick up and shoot star bits. That's it, and it worked really well. Here they wanted to put as many actions on shaking the Wiimote as possible, and it just resulted in a game that wasn't fun to control at all. Now, how does this apply to the combat, since that's mainly what your moveset is for? With such a cumbersome control scheme, combat has got to be really annoying. And it is, but don't worry too much, because this game is piss easy. For a few reasons. One of which is that just flailing will be enough to beat most enemies. 
there is no depth to the combat. It's just a waggle fest. They tried having some depth with the different ways to attack, but let's just say the enemies, which I'll go over in a bit, aren't really designed well enough to encourage anything other than flailing at them. Now, you have an inventory for a few functions. One is equipping weapons. Throughout the game, you'll obtain various weapons, and there are three different categories, being melee, throwable, and guns, though guns are lumped together with the melee weapons. At first, it appears like you can only have one melee and one throwable equipped at a time, which would mean going into the menu every time you wanted to change something out. But there is a feature to set equipment to active. When a weapon is active, you'll be able to cycle between them with the C button instead of having to go into the menu. Normally, you can only cycle the one melee weapon and one throwable you have equipped, but this allows you to cycle between any amounts of both types. This is actually a really nice feature that I think more games could use. A lot of games would have every weapon you have be cyclable, which can make it annoying trying to get a specific weapon. Or would have you go into the inventory every time you wanted to change weapons. Even a really good game like Resident Evil 4 did that. But anyways, most of the weapons feel exactly the same as each other. Almost all of the melee weapons are the same, they swing the same, they have the same reach. The knife might be shorter range, but it's not that noticeable. The only real difference, I think, is how much damage they do. It's hard to tell what is stronger, but I think it's the order they appear in the inventory. So basically just use the latest weapon you pick up. The only real difference in these weapons are the two-handed weapons. They have a different animation, and I think longer reach. But because they are two-handed, you can't use your normal flashlight when they are equipped. Even if the weapon is set to active, but you're holding a single-handed weapon, the act of equipping a two-handed weapon at all will de-equip your flashlight. This is rather annoying, but it doesn't matter much because very shortly after you get your first two-handed weapon, you get a shoulder light, which just invalidates this restriction. Throwable weapons are similar. You throw them all the same. The only real difference is some explode, like the exploding ants or grenades. These are limited and gotten through exploration though the exploded ants are gotten by killing them with bug spray. Though the most useful throwables are rocks. They are the weakest ones, but you can hold 99 of them, and it is really easy to restock. Anytime you see a big rock in the environment, it's probably where you get more rocks. And they always give you max rocks, and they never run out. Yes, the other throwables are stronger, but the rocks will get you through most of the game. So just use them until you get to some of the bosses where it would be worth using sandbags or grenades. I only used sandbags once because it was the single time I ran out of rocks, and I only used grenades against Beazelbub. There are two guns, a handgun and a shotgun, and they're not the most useful against normal enemies. Yeah, they do good damage from a distance, but one, you get them pretty late, but also you can only shoot them all in first person mode, and it can be rather awkward trying to shoot anything when there's a bunch of enemies. Plus, small enemies can get in the way of your shots. I mostly use guns against bosses, or when I was full on handgun ammo and wanted to make room for more. You have a menu for items. It holds key items, like keys, and the lighter. The lighter is for lighting lanterns, which are the save points. You can't save at a lantern that isn't lit, so you need the lighter to do this. But it's odd that this is even an inclusion. This is the only function of the lighter, and you get it so early that it really invalidates the whole thing. Why is this even a mechanic? Once you have the lighter, saving is no longer a problem. It's not like Resident Evil where you have to use ink ribbons to save at typewriters, and they are a limited resource. It's just pointless. Anyways, the main purpose for the items menu is it holds your healing items. You find healing items all over the place, in boxes, in trees, or just lying around. For the fruit and trees, you'll need to throw stuff at them to get them down, which is just tedious. Sometimes you come across these really gross-looking holes, and Ray is just perfectly okay with sticking his hand in there. God, the sounds when you do this. Like, why would anyone do this? You get items out of them, though. Except this one time where you get hurt, which is just an asshole move. There's not much of a difference between healing items other than how much health they give. There's one mushroom type that has a random effect, which is just varying amounts of health or taking away health. Also, sometimes when you pick up an item, Ray will say something stupid like, Now if I could just find a napkin. Or, Tasty Island Cuisine. And my favorite, I wonder if this will kill me. But anyways, these items are another reason the game is so easy because you get so many healing items that you have no excuse for dying to enemies. Unless some BS like this happens. But under normal circumstances, you will not take a lot of damage from enemies. 
so you're never in danger of dying unless your health is this low. Most enemies hit you for very little. You'll take a lot of chip damage, but the danger zone is very small, so there isn't much risk in delaying healing yourself. Many times I didn't even heal until I was literally one hit away from death, because I never really felt like I was in danger of dying before then. Not to mention, you heal by using them in the menu, so there's no risk of getting hit while healing. In Resident Evil 4, enemies hit like a truck. You could be killed in like three hits from normal enemies. And with more limited resources, you had to be smart about when to use healing items. Yellow herbs were also a genius mechanic. If you combine them with a green herb, using it will permanently increase your max health. But it was better to not use them right away because if you also combine it with a red herb, you get a full heal as well. So the strategy was to not heal yourself when you had a yellow herb until your health was really low to maximize the healing you'd get. Because enemies hit hard, this was a risk. Escape from Bug Island also has a healing item that permanently increases your max health, these tart mushrooms, but they also give you full heal without any combining. While the strategy of waiting until your health is low also applies here, there's less risk because of how little enemies damage you, and less strategy because it doesn't combine with the other items, nor does it take up inventory space. Resident Evil 4's inventory required management, which was part of the strategy. Sometimes you might be put in a situation where you need more inventory space, so you have to use a healing item to make room. That doesn't happen here because you have unlimited inventory. There's not much in the way of resource management in this game. You're primarily going to be using melee weapons, so it's not like you need to conserve ammo. You have limited throwables, but rocks are useful the entire game, and they are very easy to restock on. Guns aren't that useful against normal enemies, so when you fight a boss, you'll have a stockpile with no need to conserve it. And healing items are so plentiful, you won't have to be careful to not use too much. The canned foods are full heals, and I had a lot of them stockpiled for most of the game, so I was basically invincible at the end. Resource management is a big element to survival horror games, and this one fumbles completely with it. Resident Evil 4 was pretty generous with giving you ammo, but just restrictive enough where you'd still be conscious about how much you use. And this encouraged shooting enemies as little as possible, instead going for their legs or head to cause them to stumble so you can go up and hit them with a strong melee attack. And then while they were on the ground, use the otherwise weak knife to do as much damage as you could. In Escape from Bug Island, you just hit things with your melee weapon until they die. There's basically zero skill or strategy in fighting enemies, which makes combat very boring in addition to annoying thanks to the controls. Now granted, I wasn't playing on the highest difficulty, but I also wasn't playing on Resident Evil 4's highest difficulty. I was playing on normal, and there's an easy mode as well, so it can be even easier. Now let's look at the enemies. But first I should mention the flashlight. You have a flashlight that you obviously use to more easily see, and thankfully it doesn't run out of batteries. When you have the light on, it increases the distance needed before an enemy will spot you. So either see better or have enemies notice you sooner. It really doesn't matter much because of how easy the combat is. I just kept the light on the majority of the time. But one enemy type in particular makes this dangerous, the swarm. In specific places, if you approach with your light on, a swarm of bugs will attack. And if you're in that swarm, you take rapid damage. This can kill you in seconds, and is the most dangerous enemy. There's no sign of where they are, and once they are activated, you need to turn off your light and run. I found it to be inconsistent on how far you need to go before they go away. Sometimes they disappear quickly, other times I have to go to the other side of the level. You can avoid these by just not having the light on, but like I said, you can't see them until they've activated, except this one time where they're just blocking this path. But for the other enemies, there are small, medium, and large enemies. There's not much difference between the medium and large enemies, but the small ones tend to be in swarms. The centipedes are just a nuisance. They hardly do anything, and the smaller ones can be killed by just stepping on them. They are only a threat around bigger enemies because they can crawl on you, which will force you to shake them off. With motion controls, by the way. You can get them off by rolling as well if there's not too many on you. The other small enemies are much more annoying, though. The crickets and spiders. There isn't much of a difference between them. The crickets can jump on your back, but that's about it. These are the most annoying enemies in the game because they come in large groups and they are fast. Because your moveset is so clunky, it's very difficult hitting these assholes. Not to mention if you miss, which you will do like 80% of the time if you try attacking them, you're stuck in the animation, which is enough time for them to hit you. They do pitiful damage, but it's just irritating anytime they appear, and it's awful if they're with any bigger enemy. 
or you're trying to do something else because they will not leave you alone. Most of the time it's better to run past them because trying to kill them is not worth it. I suppose other small enemy types are the flying fish, but they appear very infrequently, and you can just run past them. There are killer plants which are basically bear traps, like that's it, you step on them and you get hurt. They don't do anything else. And then there are the moths, which just fly around dropping dust or something on you. They can be a bit annoying, but easy to deal with. Later in the game there are flies, but they don't hurt you, they just distract you, leaving you open for enemies to attack. Plus it's easy to shoot them when aiming for something else. They're just here to be annoying, and not add any challenge. And lastly, another one of the most annoying enemies are the exploding ants. And just like their name implies, they explode if they get too close to you. The only way to deal with them is the bug spray. You can use it without aiming, but you ain't hitting anything like that. <laughs> So you need to aim, and it's really awkward trying to hit them all because of how finicky the hitbox is. So oftentimes they just walk through. And these things are never alone, so you always have to deal with a bunch of them at a time, and you're lucky if you manage to get them all. When you kill one with bug spray, you can pick it up and use it as a throwable weapon. But even if you kill some, if you miss one and it explodes on you, it destroys all the corpses, so that's fun. For the bigger enemies, you have stuff like giant caterpillars, which roll at you and spew poison. Both attacks can be hard to dodge if you try fighting them, but they are easy to walk past. The giant frogs only appear in like one level and aren't very special. If you get behind them, they can't do much, though from a distance they can spit at you, which can be annoying. But the main threats are the ones easily identified by the music changing when they spot you. The praying mantises are the first ones you encounter, and they go down really easily because you can stun lock them. Though in swarms, they can be harder to deal with. Sometimes they can grab you and you have to shake them off, which is also true for the other bigger enemies. A couple times there will be a mantis nest, which will continually spawn more mantises, even when you're not around, so when you get close, you'll be swarmed by them. You just throw rocks at it to get rid of it. The roaches are able to fly, which is annoying, but otherwise not very remarkable, and they don't appear very often. The lizard women, however, are also one of the most annoying enemies. They move slowly, but they don't stun easily, and when they're close, they always jump on you, forcing you to shake them off. There's little you can do to prevent this. Also, for some reason, the first one you encounter, once it's dead, will spawn an insect swarm which will likely kill you. This only happens with the first one and never again. And the last enemy type are the canine men. They aren't very different from the other big enemies, they're just faster. But they're simple to take out because they stun easily. Although these guys only appear in caves, and for some reason the encounter music doesn't play in caves, so these are the only big enemies that don't have that happen. One thing with these bigger enemies is even after you knock them down, they aren't dead. They'll get back up, but you can kill them quicker if you push B when they fall over. This prompt doesn't stay for long, but even if you miss your opportunity, you can still do a finisher move by attacking downward close to them. Though both of these finishers can miss if you aren't close enough, which is just annoying and easy to happen when there's a bunch of enemies around. Now, supposedly enemies have specific weak points, but to be honest, I don't know what they are. I only found out one weakness against one boss. Though there's one note that hints towards throwing sandbags at the lizard women's faces being their weakness, but I never tried. Perhaps that could have made them less annoying, but it didn't really feel worth it to try because of how easy this game is regardless. Plus, I just forgot about it. I've said it before, and I'll likely say it again in the future, but enemies are the most important factor to a good combat system. If the enemies aren't designed well, then it doesn't matter how good your mechanics are. They aren't fun to fight. Luckily, this game has both bad combat mechanics and bad enemies, but at the very least, this game is piss easy, so the combat is just annoying rather than frustrating. One last thing to mention about the enemies is when you defeat enemies, you get these purple fragments. The purpose of these fragments are unclear, and I only know what they do because my friend told me. When you get enough fragments, it'll cause a pendant to spawn. Pendants have their own inventory slot, and you can equip them to get some kind of effect, like more defense. That sounds fine, but the problem is you aren't given these pendants when you get the required fragments. You can't even buy them from a shop or anything. They will spawn in a set location and you need to find them. You won't know if you have enough, and you won't know where they are. You could get enough fragments, but it appears in a previous level. Not to mention the final one requires 9,999 fragments. How much did they expect people to replay this game? That one in particular apparently gives you infinite throwables and regenerated health, which sounds broken, but I'm not gonna keep playing this game to find out. This doesn't really add much to the game, and it's really not worth trying to go for these. Alright, so what's the general gameplay like? It's pretty simple. This game is divided between levels, and all you're really doing is making your way to the end while fighting enemies. You have a map which fills out as you explore, and will highlight where you need to go. 
but only if you're close enough. It doesn't show it when it gets off screen, which can make it hard to know where you need to go. The map will also highlight some weapons or notes, so there's not a lot of exploration value. Why search for things yourself when the game just points them out? The level design is very straightforward. You have wide open spaces, but only one direction to go. Most levels are very similar in gameplay, without much in the way of set pieces. The main differences in levels is what enemies you fight. The only standout thing about this level is it's full of those exploding ants, and I guess you can pour honey on trees to distract them. But wow, what a change. This level has lizard women in them. That's basically the only unique thing here. The differences are mostly aesthetic, but barely, as most of the game looks basically the same. Some levels are a little different, like the cave, where it's a bit of a maze with multiple paths and dead ends, but these changes don't add much. I mean, all you're doing is walking through these narrow hallways until you reach a dead end, then go back and check a different path. There's no thought in exploring here or trying to remember where you've been because of the map. You know where you've been and where you haven't. And if the map wasn't here, then this level would just be unbearable because everything looks the same and there are no landmarks. Occasionally you'll have something kind of unique happen. Like this one part you have rocks being thrown at you. Woo. Oh, and a couple times you'll have to escort Michelle, which is very annoying. She can't die, but she moves slower than you. And if you get too far away from her, she stops moving. Like, really? You have to walk slowly here for no good reason. All it does is make things more tedious. It's not a challenge. Why couldn't it have been like Resident Evil 4 where Ashley was practically glued to your back? I still don't understand why people complain about Ashley. This is actually good escort mechanics. People who complain about her should play this game and see what a bad escort mission is. At least she can't die and it's short-lived. But there's one reoccurring mechanic that is annoying. Way too often you will have to balance on narrow paths to cross a pit or a river. And when you do this, you need to use motion controls to keep this arrow in the highlighted area, which will constantly move. This is irritating and uncomfortable, especially when having to tilt to the right. It's hard to keep it still, and with the area you need to be inside moving so much, very frequently you'll lose balance. When you lose balance, you still need to keep it in the highlighted area until you regain balance or you fall. Sometimes, even if you have it in the area, it still makes you fall. This minigame isn't in every level, but it appears often enough to be a pain in the ass and it's just not fun. The last one is falling rocks that kill you instantly if they hit you. Though if you just keep moving and not mess up, you should have no problem. One of the pendants you can get does make these minigames easier, which is very nice, but again, you'll not know how many fragments are required, nor know where to find it. You just have to be lucky. But speaking of fragments, at the end of a level, you are rewarded for completing bonus challenge. Now hold on, bonus challenges? Each level has three bonus challenges. It's just stuff like collecting a certain amount of this item, or killing this many enemies, or beating a boss within a specific amount of time. For each of these you complete, you gain extra fragments. Now this might sound like a fine addition, but the problem is you aren't told what these challenges are. There's nothing in the menu that tells you them. The only way to find out is by completing them or exiting the level. Now the thing is you can actually backtrack to previous levels by just going back at the start of the next level. And when you do, it counts as exiting the level, and thus tells you what the bonus challenges are. This is the only way to see them before playing the level, and it's dumb. At least there is a way, but it's tedious and not really worth trying to get them all anyways. So after nine levels of more or less the same boring, repetitive, annoying gameplay, you fall in the time portal and have to replay the entire game again. That's not just a story thing, you actually have to play every level you've already beaten again. The second half of the game is not much different from the first at all. The maps for each level are even already filled out. There are minor differences like how you'll find ammo for your guns, and you can do some things you couldn't before, like shoot this bag with grenades in them. Some enemy places are different, but only in some areas. As far as I can tell, the enemies are largely the same as the first time. The biggest change is there are caves that you can access that were blocked off before. Not sure what was changed that opened them up, but whatever. These caves are basically the same as the normal cave level, and just as annoying, but they contain optional items, including new weapons. The most significant change is you actually skip two levels, the river and the path. Instead, you now go through the swamp, which you didn't have access to in the first half. I honestly forgot about the river level, didn't even notice I didn't replay it. I did notice that the path was skipped, and good, that level was full of exploding ants and was really annoying. And the swamp is a slightly more interesting level because you can swim. Swimming is just the same as moving on the ground, but you can't do anything else, so it's not like it really adds much, but it's something different. 
There are limited areas where you can exit the water, which is kind of annoying, but there's some mild exploration value, I suppose. But other than this level, the second half is just the same as the first half, and it's just a huge pace breaker. You're ranked at the end of the game on a few factors, like time, total deaths, enemies killed, and completed bonus challenges. The only purpose of this, aside from just the score attack element, is if you get an A or S rank, you get the Samurai Sword and a Death Scythe, which are the best melee weapons. I didn't get them, and I don't want to play the game again to get them. They probably act exactly the same as the other weapons, but do more damage. Unless you somehow really like this game, it's just not worth going for a high rank. At various points you'll encounter a boss. Not every level has a boss. And as you'd expect, the bosses aren't very fun or interesting. First up is Purple Kong here, and this guy just won't go away. You fight him like seven times throughout the game. You think that's enough? There's one level where you fight him twice. Like, really? Thankfully, you only fight him twice in the second half, but that's only because you skip two of the levels he appears in. So mostly what the gorilla does is charge at you, which doesn't have wind up to it. And with how long it takes for you to perform different actions after other ones, you get hit by this a lot. He will also try to grab you at close range, which you just shake out of. In a couple of the fights, he is able to throw rocks, which are really easy to dodge. And in between attacks, he will pound his chest, which is the best time to attack him. Basically, all you'll do to fight him is throw rocks at him. That's it. His head is the weak spot. Hit him there and he'll get stunned. If throwing rocks at a monkey while it constantly runs you over sounds like an annoying and unfun time, it is. When you fight him in the temple, he has a lot more health. This was the only time I ran out of rocks. But it's still the same fight, it just takes longer. Though the second time you do this, you have guns, which speeds up the process. Although one time you fight him, he's just standing there shaking Harry. He doesn't even acknowledge you when you stab him. The next boss is the giant spider. The first time you fight it, you just throw rocks at it until it dies. Woo. The second time, that doesn't seem to do anything. What you need to do is throw a Molotov at its web. Then it jumps off the bridge and you fight it like normal. It's just as annoying to dodge its attacks as the gorilla. And it doesn't help that you're on this narrow bridge. You have a gun at this point, so just shoot it. There's really nothing else to this fight. Next up is the giant worm, and the first time you get here, you just run to the end. You don't even really fight it. The second time, you can actually kill it. The game hits at using grenades, but if you lure it to this cliff, you can one-shot it. That's it. Though I don't know why the first time you come here, the exploding anthills aren't there. But whatever. And honestly, the next two fights aren't really different from the others anyway. Like, Beazelbub just kind of sits there, knocking rocks down, spitting gas, and swinging its tentacles, while you're just taking it because you have so many healing items that you can easily win the War of Attrition. Just throw grenades at it and use your shotgun. The most annoying thing here are the flies that get in the way of your shots, which includes grenades, but again, you'll win the War of Attrition. And for Robert, just shoot him with a shotgun. What else can I even say? There's not much even here to discuss. The bosses suck. They're annoying to fight because of the controls, but piss easy because of all the healing items you get. They don't satisfy in any way. And that is Escape from Bug Island. It's, uh, pretty bad. There's not much good here. It's an early Wii horror game, and it feels like it. You know, this game was a launch title in Japan. It was called Necronesia, and apparently the US version is better. I don't know what the differences between these versions are, but it might have something to do with the controls. Considering how this version is, wow, I can't imagine playing a worse controlling version. This game feels like it's trying to be like Resident Evil 4, but without knowing anything about Resident Evil 4. I got a lot of Resident Evil vibes from this game, but absolutely none of the competence. That game was really smart in how it was designed, but this just feels like they threw it together in a weekend. I don't really know the behind the scenes of this game, whether it was low budget, corporate meddling, or actual incompetence, but the end result is one of the worst games I've ever played. Honestly, it's right behind Superman 64 for me. It's not as frustrating or glitchy as Superman, but it's just so unfun to play because of the controls. Even ignoring the controls, there's just not much of worth here. The combat is bare bones and shallow, the level design is basic and uninteresting, resource management is a joke, and it's just way too easy that it's boring. The most value this game has is laughing at how incompetent everything is, especially with the story and writing, and of course this gorilla. But that's it. It's not even really a so bad it's good kind of game. It's just bad. And that's all. I hope you've been enlightened now knowing about this game. And I hope you're happy now, Ben. This was for you. Happy Halloween. I'll see you guys later. And the lights will flicker on and off, just like the story. I get it. <laughs> He's the leader of the bunch You know him well He's finally back To kick some tail His coconut gun Can fire and spurt If he shoots ya It's gonna hurt He's bigger, faster And stronger too He's the first member
thanks for watching. Managed to get another video out within a month. Feels pretty nice, but things are gonna slow down a bit. This and the previous one had a deadline, so I had to rush to get them out on time, but now it can be a bit more relaxed, so don't expect this to be a regular thing. The next video I have planned is probably gonna be small, so it might not take too long, but again, things are gonna slow down. I wanted this video out this month, not just for Halloween, but my friend I mentioned who wanted me to review this game, his birthday is today, and I thought this would make a good birthday gift. So everyone wish you Ben a happy birthday. I hope this is everything you wanted it to be. And with that, if you are willing and able, please consider supporting me on Patreon if you feel I've earned it. And I want to thank Tanuki, Enemy, Just a Blank, Kaiju, Bowie, Neo, and Waluigi Number 1.